Okay, th thanks everyone for coming. Um, so today I'm going to try and uh, discuss some of the recent work in uh, studying uh, these neutron star mergers uh, at the dawn of a multi-messenger gravitational wave area uh, era. And um, first of all, before we start, I, I should say that I was really uh, fortunate and lucky to have wonderful collaborators over the past years. and. Uh, I will um, try and acknowledge uh, their contribution uh, through the slides. Uh, most of them are actually uh, young students or early career researchers, so um, I will try to acknowledge their contribution, as I said. And uh, so I will try to be, I, I know that there is quite a various expertise in this room, so I will try not to go into any technicalities, but uh, please interrupt me if you think I'm, I'm saying something too de too detailed, or I'd rather skip some slides at the end, uh, but uh, prefer not to lose half of the audience in in the second slide. Uh, so uh, I guess if we want to talk about uh, multi-messenger astronomy, we have to go back a bit in time, uh, back to well, uh, a bit more than a century, when this guy here, the face uh, you're very much familiar with, uh, published his uh, theory of general relativity. And one of the predictions there uh, was that the uh, small perturbation to the uh, space uh, time metric uh, would propagate uh, in space as uh, gravitational waves, um, as uh, ripples in, in the space time. Um, and, and, and these, uh, these uh, gravitational waves would, would actually uh, perturb the, 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 the space-time itself and all the objects in, in it, uh, as shown in, the, in this uh, animation here, which is a bit exaggerated, but where you see that uh, the passage of a gravitational wave traveling at the speed of light uh, would uh, squeeze and stretch the, the space-time and all the objects in it. And so the relative change in length, uh, which is uh, the so-called strain, uh, yeah, is, it turns out to be proportional to the second time derivative of the quadruple moment and inversionally proportional to the distance. So this is good. It means, I mean, compared to electromagnetic waves, the, the how strong the gravitational wave is actually scale uh, only inversionally proportionally to, 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 to the distance, which is good for us. Uh, but we also have this uh, second time derivative here. So we need uh, accelerating masses that uh, for which this uh, term here is, is, is uh, non-zero. Uh, and it turns out that uh, a, a good system for this, and, and this is what I would focus on during my talk, are binary binary systems. Uh, so uh, uh, stars uh, in, a, in a binary system, in a binary system, um, and in particular, uh, 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 binary uh, compact object, uh, a binary system of compact objects. Uh, and uh, one important thing is that if you look at this, uh, this uh, constant of proportionality here, uh, G is a relatively small number, actually a quite, quite a small number, and C is a quite big number uh, to, the, to the four powers. So this, this factor here is extreme, extremely small, so 10 to the minus 49 in uh, CGS. And so we need, uh, we need special systems uh, to get uh, relatively large uh, values of this strain. Uh, and I mean, this is not a, an exact derivation, but we can express the second, uh, the, the, uh, second time derivative of the quadruple moment as m, the total mass in the system, times the velocity squared. Um, and the, if, you, if you think about uh, two neutron stars in a binary system, um, neutron stars for just for the context, these are extremely compact stars. So you should imagine the mass of a sun uh, down to uh, uh, a sphere with a radius of uh, roughly 10 kilometers. So the densities are extremely high. Uh, and then uh, what, what you get is that if you have two neutral stars of 1.4 solar masses, for instance, and at the very end, when the, the two neutral stars merge, they approach relativistic speed, uh, so let's say the speed of light. You plug in these numbers, you put this system at 50 megaparsec, what you get out is a strain of the order of 10 to the minus 21. Um, you can 
do a similar uh, thing with, with two black holes rather than neutron stars, so a bit, a bit more massive uh, objects. Uh, you can also put, place them a bit far, farther away, uh, one kiloparsec, and you get a similar number there. So we are talking about strains of 10 to the minus 21 or so. Uh, and <coughs> this means that if we, if we, for instance, we have a gravitational wave passing through the solar system, uh, the, the, the distance from us to the sun will be, which is uh, 150, roughly 150 million kilometers, will be changed by a very, very small number uh, amount. So we have roughly one angstrom. So this gives you an idea of how uh, small these perturbation, uh, perturbations are. But this is now uh, nowadays reality, uh, thanks to the, uh, these uh, LIGO and VILGO interferometers. Uh, so we have, nowadays we have uh, also others, but these are, I will focus most of, of my talk on. Uh, these three interferometers, two in the US, one in, uh, in Louisiana, Le in Livingstone, and one in Washington State at Amford, and then we have one here in Italy near Pisa, um, which is Virgo. Um, and so, as I said, the perturbations are pretty small, but it's even worse than that, because if, if you imagine to have a ruler that can, can measure such small perturbation, also the ruler itself would be uh, squeezed or stretched. So it would be nearly basically impossible to measure these in the classical way, let's say. Um, and so how this, uh, how can these uh, measure these, these changes? They use the only, basically the only quantity that is insensitive to this, uh, which is the, the speed of light itself. So you have this constant, which is always uh, the same number. And, and, and so the, what they are, they are interferometers. Uh, so we have two uh, these interf L-shaped interferometers. Each each uh, arm is uh, four kilometers long. And so what you want to measure is a change in each of these R of the order. This time we are not we don't have uh, one astronomical unit, but we have four kilometers, so it's even smaller. So we are talking about sizes that are smaller than the proton radius. So <coughs> these are really really small uh, changes. And the way you do this is through these interferometers. So you use, you, you have a beam of light that you split into the two different arms, uh, four kilometers long. And then each beam will propagate four kilometers. So we get reflected by a mirror. And then when, when these two beams recombine here, they, they have an, an interference pattern. And if, if these are exactly four kilometers long, we will not observe any signal there, so you will have a destructive interference. Um, but if a gravitational wave passes through here, the ch these are not exactly four kilometers, so you change the, the length of the arm uh, a bit, and then you create a, a pattern. And from this pattern, you can actually infer what was the, the gravitational wave passed through and uh, what was uh, its uh, strain and other properties. So this is this was a incredible uh, technological achievement, you can imagine, uh, like small perturbation near the sides, like uh, small earthquakes, or even a, a train passing by, the ocean waves also could uh, induce a, a signal in the interferometer. So you, all, you, all, you need to characterize these and correct for these to see the, the signal from gravitational wave. Uh, and uh, in 2015, on uh, uh, September 14, uh, the first gravitational wave uh, from a from emerging uh, black hole binary uh, was uh, detected by LIGO. Uh, and here you see, uh, again, here you see the strain. So orders of 10 to the minus 21, dot that number we, we saw before. Uh, in the two detectors in Louisiana and uh, in Washington, uh, this is the signal here, uh, and these are these were the predictions, and so you see that they, they are pretty consistent. And here you see how the frequency uh, changes as a function of time. So obviously, as the two black holes are merging, their frequency increases with time, and this is the so-called chirp signal that was detected in both in both interferometers. Uh, this was, as I said, the first direct detection of gravitational waves. Uh, 
and it was followed and it was actually awarded, as you all know, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, uh, the, the LIGO detectors, uh, interferometers detected the, the first gravitational wave signal from the merger of two neutron stars on August uh, 17. Um, so here again, you can see this, this very nice track here in LIGO Livingstone. And perhaps it, I mean, if, if we go back a bit, you might notice the difference in the time scale here. Here we are talking about a fraction of a second when the signal goes into this uh, frequency band. Uh, in this other case, we have tens of seconds. So this already tells us that the, the objects that merged are actually lighter. Um, and uh, you might see the same track here in M4. Uh, Virgo did not detect the signal, but it was really important as we've seen a second to localize the origin of the signal. Um, and so this was consistent, the signal was consistent with the merger, uh, a merger of two neutral stars at 40 megaparsec, relatively nearby. Uh, and, and it was already a great discovery per se, uh, but what made it even more exciting was the detection uh, of a gamma ray uh, signal a, a couple of seconds after the merger. Um, from uh, gamma ray satellites, you see them here. So we have like the Fermi satellite, the integral satellite. You see this spike here? This was the gamma ray uh, detection that was coming from a similar region of the sky and only two seconds after this gravitational wave signal. So pretty much everyone who had a telescope uh, pointed that into that direction. And here again, Virgo was very important to help uh, reducing the, uh, the probable possible area the, the, the signals were coming from. Um, and then uh, 11 hours later, a new transient was found. So basically people look for uh, the optical, I mean, the, the, the transient at other wavelengths, uh, energies or frequencies. Uh, and so uh, 11 hours later, this new dot here that was not present in an archival image image taken a few weeks before, popped up uh, in the outskirts of this uh, galaxy here. And so this was confirmed by uh, different teams to be the electromagnetic transient, uh, sorry, the electromagnetic counterpart of this event. Can you remind me why there seems to be an offset between the, the, the signal the signal? And this, second, yeah. between this one and well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I, well, I mean, this, as I will say in a second, this is coming from the actual gamma ray uh, burst that was powered during the, the event. And so you obviously, well, obviously, you, you have a, a dependence on, on, on the energy. And right. so uh, this is basically reflecting the, well, the, how well the SCD or the, how it evolves with the, I, I guess there are people here in the room that normal evolution normal evolution of a gamma ray burst no? starting yeah. the so right okay and so you see it. right um and so what, were, what were the expectations actually in terms of electromagnetic counterparts uh, for these neutral star, binary neutral star mergers? So this is a cartoon that I really like because it shows uh, on one side uh, the different uh, ejecta components, the different components uh, that are there, and on the right the, the, the transient that is associated with them. Um, and so as, as I just said, the, the, the expectation was that this neutral star merger would power a jet, a relativistic jet, uh, uh, that was actually seen in this event. I mean, it was seen even before, but it was seen also in this event as this gamma ray emission here. Um, and then this, this jet is thought to collide with the interstellar medium, the circumverse medium, uh, and power uh, uh, an afterglow at, at 
pretty much at all other wavelengths. So you go from the, uh, as that was seen in this event, you go from the X-ray here, where you see this, uh, this evolu particular evolution, then the optical and also up to radio wavelengths. Um, I, I won't have time to go into the details about these GRB uh, uh, observations. What I will focus on today is the so-called kilonova. And so this is a, a transient uh, that is coming from the material that gets ejected during and after the merger. Um, and this is just, I will come back to this in a second, but this shows the, uh, the spectrum, the spectral time series. So these are spectra like flux as a function of wavelength. Uh, in the near UV, optical, and near infrared. And you see uh, and each spectrum is a different epoch. So you see in just a week or so, there was a very rapid evolution in the spectrum. And I will come back to this uh, in a second. Um, this, as I said, started the uh, multi-messenger uh, era uh, where with one single event, this one in 2017, we could make major leaps in different uh, areas of physics and astrophysics uh, and, and in major leaps in our understanding of, of the universe. And so I will try and touch upon uh, at least a couple of these boxes here, but very briefly, so what we, what we learned was that the um, heavier elements we have on, uh, here on Earth, like gold, platinum, but uh, basically mo most of the elements higher, uh, heavier than iron are actually coming from this event, or at least uh, this is one of the most promising um, pro progenitor scenario for, for, for these uh, nucleosynthesis of heavy elements. Um, and we also, thanks to this event, uh, now starting started to, to learn more about the atomic physics in terms of the opacities of these elements, which was not really much very much explore up to uh, 2017. We learn a bit about uh, nuclear physics and I will uh, discuss this more in detail later. Uh, we learn uh, um, more about uh, binary, stellar and binary evolution, so the origin of, of some of these gamma ray bursts, particularly these so-called short gamma ray bursts, was uh, uh, um, a subject of very long debate for, many, for a few decades. Uh, as some people thought, okay, they come from massive uh, explosion of massive stars. Some thought about uh, neutral star mergers, and this was the this event was a smoking gun because we knew uh, from the gravitational wave that this was a neutral star merger, and we saw the short gamma Um The in terms of general relativity, uh, the, the the simultaneous detection of uh, light and gravity. Uh, set very tight constraints on the speed of gravity because we only had two seconds of delay uh, in two signals that, that uh, travel for, a, uh, I mean, uh, for um, uh, a very long path. So we can put very tight constraints on the speed of gravity and rule out some of the uh, theories of uh, modified gravity. Uh, and I will come to this uh, later in the, in the talk about using actually these systems to study uh, the expansion of our universe. Um, I thought that uh, I should maybe talk a bit, a bit more about Kilonovi. Uh, um, and and I, I always like to, to start with this uh, sentence from this review article by Brian Metzger because all the, the ingredients are in this, what I call definition. So uh, basically Kilonovi are day to week long uh, thermal supernova-like transients, which are powered by the radioactive decay of heavy neutral beach elements synthesized in the expanding merger uh, ejector. Uh, so let's let's start. Let's imagine we have a seed nucleus with some number of protons, some number of neutrons, and we put this uh, nucleus in a very neutronized ejector, uh, neutronized environment. So we have a lot of free neutrons there. Uh, what happens is that some of these neutrons get, cap get captured uh, by, by the seed nucleus. And uh, how they get captured depends on uh, the, basically the neutron capture time scale compared to the beta decay. Uh, and I will try to explain this here. So we have this uh, so-called table of nucleates where you have the number of protons, 
on the y axis, number of neutrons on the and, uh, x axis. Uh, I think we actually have one right at the, the, the back of this room. Uh, and, um, and so let's start with one isotope, like let's say 138 lanthanum. Um, and let's imagine we, we capture neutrons. Um, so what we go, uh, wh where we go is to the right. So we capture neutrons. We still have lanthanum, so we're not producing new elements, but we are producing new isotopes. Um, but at some point, uh, this may uh, beta decay. And so what, what beta decays does uh, is converting a neutron into a proton. And then we go from uh, uh, lanthanum to cerium. So uh, we, the, the atomic mass stays the same. We are just converting a neutron into a proton. Uh, but we, we, may, we created a new element, cerium. And so depending on uh, the, the time scale for these two, uh, uh, how these two time scales compare, uh, then we have two different processes. You might have studied, uh, well, I studied many years ago. Uh, before getting into this uh, uh, field, uh, but basically you have a S process for S for slow, where you basically capture a neutron here. So here I'm plotting the same thing. It's from an old paper. Um, you capture a neutron, but then right away you beta decay. So you cannot go much farther away from this so-called uh, valley of beta stability. But we have many elements that actually, at least in part, are are created in the universe thanks to this low uh, S process. But if the, the time scale uh, for beta decays is much longer than neutron capture, then you can uh, go far farther away from this value of beta stability. So you have many neutron capture, go to the right, and then you go, uh, you beta decay, and then you move away from this. And you build up uh, uh, heavier and heavier elements. However, these, these nuclei that you, you synthesize are uh, unstable, uh, and so they radioactive decay. Um, and so there are different channels, so they can radioact uh, radioactively decay through beta decay. So again, you go in this direction. You can have alpha decay, so you can uh, emit an alpha, part uh, alpha particle, or you can also go through fission. Um, and here is just a, it's, it's a movie this works uh, of a real simulation, actually, where you see again the same uh, the same table of nucleides, uh, and here you see the time scale. So, on the order of milliseconds, you you build up all these heavy elements, and then this starts to radioactive decay back to the valley of beta stability. All, all over like seconds, minutes, hours, days, and months, or even years. So these are a, a lot of radioactive material that on th with different time scale radioactive decay to uh, stability. And this is actually what powers what we call a kilonova. So the, these decay products like alpha particles, beta particles, uh, fission fragments, and so on, they thermalize within the ejecta and set the actual temperature of the ejecta. So just for reference, we are talking about a few thousand Kelvin in the first day or so, depending on the actual model. But then we have a, we have a thermal emission uh, of this material, this hot material, then that actually powers what we call a kilonova. And so again, we are talking about a thermal transient um, that is powered by the radioactive decay of these uh, R-process elements. And one, one final uh, property of this kilonovi uh, is uh, the evolution, um, so they are a day to week long transients. And here I'm just plotting the kilonova from 2017. This is a, sorry, a Liker, so magnitude is a function of time. And you see this is the kilonova from 2017. And this is a typical supernova, uh, type 1A supernova. Uh, and you see that they are much fainter, but also they evolve much more rapidly. Uh, without going into details, this, the, the main idea is that uh, compared to a supernova, where you might eject the, the entire star, so 1.4 solar masses for a white dwarf, uh, and a good, uh, good fraction of these is radioactive, 
in neutral star mergers, you eject a much smaller masses, so 0.01 solar masses on the order. Uh, and all of it is radioactive. So you have much less radioactive material, so it's fainter because you have less energy. But you also have much less material around. So the, the actual material that you ejected is less opaque. Uh, and so radiation can escape more freely. So you, you, the evolution is much more rapid. I will come back to this. This, of course, means that they are much more difficult to catch these kilonovae compared to the supernovae that can stay bright for like months, years, and, um, if they are nearby enough. Um, okay, so if we go back to the event in 2017, one important uh, property of this event was this very rapid evolution from a blue, what we call blue spectrum, which means a spectrum that peaks in the near UV or the blue optical, to a spectrum that peaks in the near infrared or even in far infrared. Um, and you can see this actually in the discovery image, I hope, even from the back, you see that this is the image taken at discovery, which you see this kind of pale blue dot. And 8.5 days later, this was red. Um, and this was interpreted as the presence, as due to the presence of different components in, in the material that was ejected. So it was not a spheric, spherically symmetric uh, material ejected with uniform uh, properties. But we had at least two uh, components here. Typically in the, in the literature, this has been called as blue or red kilonova. And, and so if we start from the blue kilonova, uh, so, so basically the difference is due to the different elements that were produced. So in this material, again, I won't go into the details, but in this material, only relatively light elements were produced. So this is a special periodic table where the color coding tells you the origin of the elements. And so in this, in this material here, only these light, ele light elements, let's say, were produced. And what's important is that the opacities of these elements are relatively low in the blue and uh, in the blue and short wavelengths, let's say. And so the radiation can actually escape here because it's not the material is not opaque, and then you can have a blue spectrum. <coughs> um, in the case of the red kilonov, instead, we have material that can produce the conditions are such that you can produce much heavier elements in the periodic table. And, and what's important is that especially these lanthanides here, but all these heavy elements have very high opacities in the UV optical. And so basically all the flux that tries to escape, tries to escape from this wavelength will get blocked by this op opaque material and get reprocessed in the infrared. And so uh, this was interpreted by different uh, groups as the presence of at least two components in this material. And, and this is quite important in terms of our process nucleosynthesis. In the context of this talk, actually, what's important here is that it's pretty clear that you cannot model these systems, these, these kilonovi in particular, as uh, using spherically symmetric uh, models. And so this is actually where uh, kind of I spent most of my time in the past few years uh, developing this uh, radius transfer code, which is 3D. So you need 3D uh, codes to deal with this. And it's a radius transfer code. So you can actually track the propagation of photons in this hot and um, dense material expanding. And so... Very briefly, you have how the, so the, its properties like density, temperature, composition, and such. You run a Monte Carlo radius transfer, and then you use the escaping photons to actually produce the, predict the observables, like uh, the spectra that we've seen, the light curves, uh, but also polarization. So I, I won't have time to go into the details about polarization, but you can also study the polarization that gives you information on the geometry of these uh, mergers. And one important aspect is that because it's not spherically symmetric, 
it really depends uh, how, so how, uh, what the kilonova look like uh, looks like it really depends on uh, the uh, where the observer is so you have a view in angle dependence so an observer sitting here will see a different kilonova compared to one looking there and I will come back to this uh, later I will go very quickly here actually uh, so in terms of the input models you can actually uh, cook up your own model. So you can say, okay, I, I use some idealized geometry and, uh, and, and, and parameterized by different parameters, and then I can run large grids of models where I vary this parameter. And the code, I mean, it's not a code that you can run on your laptop, uh, but it's relatively fast that we are talking about a few hundred CPU hours that you can create large grids of models on small clusters or supercomputers. And, and basically explore the parameter space. But you can also uh, take the input directly from uh, numerical relativity simulations. So people uh, who uh, actually model the actual merger of the neutral stars and, and as an outcome, they tell you uh, how the ejecta looks like. And then you can plug this in into my core and predict the observables. And these, these are I, I flagged just a, a few works that we, we, we did in the past few years. I won't have time to go into the details. Uh, and these were all led by uh, students. Uh, the first thing you, you, you might want to do is, of course, feed the, the event in 2017. And so you take this grid. Uh, well, you vary some parameters. Um, it's not important uh, to, to tell you which parameters today. but you vary parameters, you feed them to the light curve. So this again is UV through optical to infrared light curves. Um, you feed them and you can infer, make inference on the ejecta parameters. So this we've done on, in different papers. Uh, the last uh, grid was actually published, well published. We submitted a paper a few months ago. Uh, as I said, I, I just want to flash uh, two examples so why multi-messenger is important in terms of the in terms of cosmology the Hubble constant and equational state uh, the experts are actually in this room uh, cosmologists and uh, uh, people who do equational state so if I say something stupid just stop interrupting uh, but let's start with the cosmology and so uh, this is uh, I mean, cosmology in terms, as I said, uh, in terms of the Hubble constant, which uh, tells us the, uh, the, ex the local exponential rate of our universe. And so this goes back to almost a century when uh, Edwin Hubble uh, discovered that like this uh, nebulae that now we know, well, that he also discovered being actual ga galaxies outside our own, uh, were, were moving away from us with a velocity it was proportional to the, the distance, okay? Um, and, and so you see the, this is from the actual paper, uh, and this, this, uh, this, um, this rate uh, of expansion is exactly the Hubble constant. And you might have heard that the, in the past few years, uh, there has been this uh, so-called Hubble tension growing uh, between like measurements of this Hubble constant from the early universe here, uh, sorry, down here, uh, like Planck, most notably, which find uh, find a value of roughly 70, uh, s sorry, 67 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec, uh, and the measurements of this quantity from uh, the late universe, most notably from uh, type 1 supernovae. Uh, again, without going into the details, we have this, this uh, tension which could be some hidden systematics in either of these two uh, probes or some uh, new physics. And so it would be great to have an alternative approach that can have arbitrary distension. And this was actually suggested already in the 80s by Bernard Schultz to be uh, uh, gravitational waves. Um, and in particular, uh, um, I mean, uh, used as standard sirens, where you basically get the redshift that you need to get the velocity, basically, uh, 
directly, uh, I mean, from the identification of a, a transient. So the, in this event in 2017, we had the transient, we had the galaxy, so you can get the redshift. And the distance, you get it from the gravitational wave. So gravity gives you distance and light gives you the redshift. And then in a model independent way, you get H naught if you trust uh, GR, basically. The problem, the, the catch here is that the, uh, the distance, in the gravitational wave signal, the distance is degenerate with the inclination. So you get the same signal here uh, for an edge-on system nearby uh, and for a face -on, face -on, the same system view face-on but uh, uh, much farther away. Uh, and so you have this degeneracy, which means that when you try and play this game, which was done in 2017, you get a large degeneracy. So here you see the Hubble constant as a function of the inclination. And these, these are the uh, posteriors uh, on, on, on this quantity on H naught from this event by the LIGO Virgo collaboration. And these two are the numbers I mentioned before, like Planck and uh, Shoes or, I mean, late universe measure. And so, well, you, you can actually uh, get a posterior here. And I mean, it's consistent. So what was funny is that it was consistent with both, but unfortunately not uh, accurate enough to, uh, to actually arbitrate this tension. And so uh, the one idea we put forward uh, a few years ago was that if you, if you know the inclination from another probe, not from gravitational waves, but from a, a, the actual electromagnetic counterpart, you can reduce this degeneracy and then reduce the uh, uncertainty on H naught. Um, and as I said, Kilonovi are viewing angle dependent. So depending where you look, look the system from, you get different results. And so in, uh, a few years ago, uh, we had this paper led by uh, Sue in, in Stockholm, where we looked at uh, how much you can improve uh, by taking one of these kilonova grids, feed it to the data, get an inclination angle, which was roughly 25 degrees from the Z axis. And then here is how much you improve on H naught in terms of the uncertainties. I don't think we are yet at the stage where you can trust these numbers itself, but it was more like a proof of concept study where you see basically how you can reduce the uncertainty. And this is again the same Kind of plots I showed before, black with gravitational waves only, red with the kilonova constraint. Um, if you want to know more about this, actually we write a review article a couple of years ago, putting together all the different studies uh, in using not just the kilonovi, uh, but also the GRB, which are also viewing angle dependent, uh, to reduce this degeneracy. And uh, I should say that the actual first study uh, pointing this out uh, was led by Cristiano uh, well, a couple of months after the event uh, using the GRB afterglows uh, to get the inclination and then to reduce the uncertainty on H0. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are fixing the angle or you propagate also some uncertainties. No, 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 the, the angle is not fixed. So yeah. basically the, the Kilonov, well, both in the GRB modeling but the Kilonov modeling, the viewing angle is a parameter. So you actually feed your grid to the data and you get a, a constraint on the inclination. And then with this, uh, unfortunately I cut out a panel here. So if you look in the paper, there is a panel here that gives you the constraint on the, the inclination um, uh, from the kilonova feed. Um, and this, this is what actually reduces these black contours into these white ones. Going to nuclear physics, uh, I'd like to start with this, uh, this plot here uh, where uh, we have the equation of a bunch of equation of states. Uh, it's not really important where they come from, but a bunch of equation of states that tell you uh, the relation between pressure and density uh, in, terms, in units of the uh, nuclear separation density. <coughs> And this plot try to this plot tries to to show you how uh, different probes will give you different constraints on the equation of state uh, of nuclear matter, and so you, you can study you can constrain try to constrain the equation of state 
uh, at relatively low, uh, uh, small, uh, low densities, up to two times. I mean, these bounds are actually quite loose. They are not, but just to give you an idea, uh, you can study these uh, with theory, actually, uh, but also in, in the lab, uh, with nuclear physics experiment, by, well, smashing um, heavy nuclei uh, together. Um, but you, you cannot go to very high densities. This you can do actually with the neutron stars, because as we saw before, these are very compact objects. You can get to very high densities. Uh, and, and you can probe, probe these with gravitational waves in the spiral phase. So as the two neutron stars are merging, uh, you basically probe the, the density of the, actual, the, the, the neutron stars themselves. And at the moment, uh, LIGO and Virgo are sensitive to not, not very massive neutron stars. So we're talking about 1. Point, let's say 1.5 solar masses or so. But you can still reach these sort of densities in the core of the neutron star. If you want to study even more massive neutron stars, you can do this with isolated neutron stars uh, or also neutron stars in binaries uh, in our own galaxy uh, through radio and x-ray uh, measurements. Again, I won't go into the details. Um, if you want to go to even higher densities, then what you can do is you, st you can study the uh, gravitational waves after the merger. So you have two neutron stars, they merge, they give you a, an object which is even more dense. And then, uh, and then you, you, you can study this uh, higher density, but this is not possible with LIGO and Virgo at the moment. It will be possible in the future with Einstein telescope and future detectors. But you can study this also with uh, the, the electromagnetic transit uh, itself. And I will show this uh, here. So this is a paper that was actually um, published very recently, uh, led by the student Laurie that visited the department, you might, uh, some of you might remember, uh, with Francesco and Alessandro. Uh, where we looked at a uh, neutron star black hole system in this case, but it's, it's not really important here, but we, we made, uh, we used the code to create grids where we vary the, the, the mass of the neutron star, the mass of the black hole, and the spin of the black hole. And then you produce the kilo nova, and uh, you do it for, for each system, you do it for different equation of states. So here uh, I'm showing three of them. Uh, one which is quite stiff, one which is quite soft, and one in between. And it turns out that for this specific choice of the parameters, for instance, the uh, the softest equation of state is is too soft, is so soft that the objects uh, are pretty compact. So you can squeeze the the matter quite a lot. And so when the two neutrons, sorry, when the neutron star and the black hole merge, merge. Uh, no material is ejected. So they all go, uh, they basically collapse to a black hole without any material, and so you don't have material to power the kilonova. And so this is why you don't see any purple line here. But you, you get some material for these other two, and the different lines, sorry, are the different viewing angles. So you see that there, you also have a viewing angle dependence. But you can also study how this varies with the, the with, with these parameters. Here I'm showing with the, the dependence with the spin. So if, if the black hole is not spinning, then uh, the kilonova is very faint. And, uh, and also for this equation of state, you don't expect a kilonova. So this is how you can actually probe the equation of state with the kilonova in a nutshell. Uh, and going back to this, what one could do is to put all these things together, actually, because we have observations and uh, uh, laboratory experiments in each of these box. Uh, and, and then you can put this together. And this is, uh, we've been working uh, on this uh, uh, open source framework, NMMA, where uh, you can put all these different uh, experience, ex experiments and observation together to place constraints on the, neutron, the nuclear matter equation of state. So this is shown here in terms of the radius of a uh, 1.4 solar mass uh, neutron star. And well, it's basically showing at each step how much you gain in the precision. Uh, uh, so this is one of the 
results we found in one of the papers uh, in the past few years. I thought I'd just mention this more like uh, uh, as a reminder for Alessandro, we should be doing this uh, soon. Uh, but we, we had this idea, uh, Alessandro and I, that we, we can actually explore even more exotic uh, physics where you don't have a merger of two neutral stars, but of two quark stars. And um, we, we have this idea basically of using this relatively old model uh, from 2010 uh, that shows quite a, a different uh, distribution of the material. So this is a density map. Uh, and then try and uh, explore what the kilonova would look like in this scenario, which is not, has never been done in the literature. So I think this would be quite interesting to, we have this simulation, so it's just a matter of plugging them in in, in my code and run uh, and get the kilonova out of it. Um, in the last part of my talk, I, I wanted to uh, put these things in, in uh, well, to go a bit beyond the event in 2017. So these are, this is the timeline for the LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra. This is the, the exact interferometer. I didn't discuss too much. Um, and so here in the first observing run, we had the uh, binary black hole uh, merger. Then we have this event we discussed a bit today. Uh, and then uh, basically before COVID hit, uh, uh, the third observing run uh, started. Uh, and for, with a lot of excitement, people wanted to get more of this multi-messenger event. Unfortunately, we did not detect new ones. As I said, these are intrinsically hard to catch, the kilonovi. So we did detect uh, more binary interstar merger and interstar black hole mergers, but the, we did not detect electromagnetic counterparts. As I said, kilonovi are hard to catch, and they're even more hard to catch when they are at large distances, and they are, you have to search for them in huge uh, sky areas. So this is showing a table with all the events issued by the LIGO and Virgo uh, collaboration that were suggested to host a neutron star and for which potentially uh, one would, ex would expect an a electromagnetic counterpart. But if you, if you look here, you see that the uh, distance was much larger than the one from the event in 2017. We are talking about uh, hundreds of megaparsecs, sometimes 200, 300, 600 megaparsecs. So obviously it would be hard to catch a very faint transient from there. But also the localization from the gravitational wave interferometer was much poorer. So you see it was 30 degrees, square degrees for um, 17 by 17. And here we are talking about tens of thousands of uh, square degrees. So this is pretty much the old sky or a good chunk of the sky. And of course, you want to find the kilova quickly because in a day or two it's gone. I mean, there's no, there's no way you can get it. And indeed, we did not get it. But uh, I think it, this was, it was still possible to search for this uh, because of this, uh, so I mean, this large, uh, uh, large uh, sky survey uh, where uh, you basically search the sky with these um, large uh, camera, cameras. Um, so this is uh, the specific example of the Zwick transit facility. So it's a survey at Mount Palomar in California. It uses a relatively small telescope, like one, one meter telescope but with a very big camera. So this is 47 square degrees. So, and here is shown compared to other, I mean, of course you, you cannot see down here, but um, this is a pretty big chunk of the sky. So this is the uh, Andromeda galaxy, this is the moon. And so you can actually scan and, uh, these very large areas. And I, I'm gonna show this uh, here in this slide for this specific event. So this was uh, the second binary neutral star merger detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, sorry, not by Virgo. It was actually, I think, only one interferometer, which explained why the localization was so poor. Uh, and here I'm going to show in a series of three nights, so night zero, night one, and night two, how ZTF can actually cover this large chunk of the sky in two filters. 
So each square here is basically this uh, 47 square degree um, in the sky. And then you can see that in, in a, basically in a night, in two nights basically, in G and three nights in R, pretty much the whole area could be covered, uh, at least in the north. So this is in the south, so this is in California, so you cannot cover it. Um, but this is actually possible in a night or two to, to cover this uh, thousand of square degrees. We did not detect any counterpart for any of these events, uh, no, no other groups did. Uh, you might have noticed that this event here was very well localized, actually. It was far away, but very well localized, even better localized than ever in 2017. And it was a special one also because it was the merger of a uh, 23 square mass black hole with uh, an object that could be either a neutral star or a black hole. It's a bit quite massive for a neutral star, but it's also quite light for a black hole. So it was not clear back then what was it. Uh, we did follow this up with, not with ZTF, the Zwicky Transfer Facility, but with, the, with DECAM, which is uh, another camera uh, on a bigger telescope actually in, in the south, um, in Chile. And you can still, even if you don't detect a, a transit, you can still do some science. So uh, why is that? Because, so this is showing in these filters, infrared filters, the range of magnitudes or light curves, uh, the range of magnitude uh, as a function of time, where you would expect the kilonova based on well, my models in this case. And then you take the observations. The observation, these triangles tell you that the, no transient was found, but at least you can say, okay, if there was a transient here, you had to be fainter than this. So it basically put an upper limit on the brightness of your transient. And so you can basically start ruling out some of these bright kilonovi at the distance suggested by the Gravitational wave interferometer. Doesn't this assume that the star group will be in the sky? Yeah, that's a good point. But but for the, this is in general true, and and you always um, need to be careful when you're talking about thousand square degrees. But this is twenty three degrees square degrees. So with ZTF, you have, it's just one, one, one. You you, you get all the. Unfortunately, I don't have the, the map there, but it's a small, it's not this specific event, sorry. It's, it's just a small one, a small localization area. So for this specific event with, with the DECAM, so you, you could, we would, could cover all the area. Oh, it's localized, it's in the peak of the Yes, no, exactly. So, I mean, the, this is assuming also, I mean, you also, I mean, you're probing a volume, right? So. This is the median distance, but you also have a, an uncertainty there, which I guess was in this. You have this uncertainty, so it, it also depends on uh, the actual distance, of course. But you can play this game and, uh, in principle, start ruling out some of the parameter space. And I won't go into the details, but a, a constraint on the likers means a constraint on the ejector parameters, which means a constraint on the properties of the binary, like masses and, and so on. Yeah. Not on top of the okay. actually, but we can we can look this up. Yes. Yeah. It's right here. But uh, the distance that you're assuming here doesn't just depend on whether it's a real black hole, black hole, or neutron star, black hole. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Oh, that's a good question. So I mean, one should look into, I mean, this paper here, I, I think they, you, you always have this like. Uh, so this 267 is a neutron star black hole, or black hole, black hole. Well, I guess, so, so if you look at the, at the paper here, so what they do typically, they, uh, they put a prior on the, you always have two, two uh, 
two different constraints, one with uh, depending on the prior of the black hole spin, because that also is important. Uh, but then <coughs> there you always have the general CC. So I guess this is probably the medium uh, accounting for all the possible general CC. Yeah. Yes. yes. The sun is an accurate position of the Say again, sorry. I, I don't understand how you can localize it. Well, this is possible. If you have, uh, I have to remind myself, but I think this this was def this was definitely detected by the two LIGO interferometers. But I'm I'm pretty sure it was it was either detected by Virgo as well or as in 2017, it was not detected, but the fact that Virgo was observing back here was important to exclude some areas. So if you have three detectors observing, you can localize them down to these uh, tens of square degrees. So this is possible. And of course, the more interferometers you have, the better. Okay, I should probably speed up a bit. I'll, I'm gonna skip uh, on, go very quickly here, but the future, so now we are here, and uh, right, actually today, the interferometers are gonna break for a couple of months. So I think uh, they, I mean, I think Living, uh, Livingstone stopped half an hour ago and uh, Louis, um, M4 will stop in, in two hours or so. And then they will uh, be offline for a couple of months and then we'll, they will start again. But so far we haven't detected any, any uh, electromagnetic transient. Uh, things will be better in 05, uh, thanks uh, to better interferometers. So here we're talking about, I think we probably we do want to talk about 2030s uh, or maybe late 2020s. So we will have better interferometers, uh, but also uh, uh, better instruments to follow this up. And so we will have LSST uh, in Chile. Uh, so this is again a very big camera, a bit smaller than CTF, but, uh, the, but mounted on a much larger telescope, not a one meter telescope, but 8.4 meter telescope. Um, and so we will be able to follow this up more uh, efficiently. Uh, and uh, from space, we will have also this, uh, um, it was doubly first, now it's called Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, that will allow us to, to go uh, also much into the infrared. Uh, which we, is, pre, is pretty important to catch uh, Kinonomi. I would probably keep this, so this is showing uh, some predictions of how uh, Vera Rubin, LSST, and uh, Grace Roman uh, will be able to, to follow up Kinonovi uh, even at one gigaparsec. So here we're talking about, of course, the new interferometers, LIGO and Virgo, we start detecting in the future more and more distant events. And so we, we, we need to, uh, to have instruments that can actually see these faint transients at one gigaparsec or a few hundred gigaparsec. And this is possible, like if you see here with Roman, you can, these, these solid lines are the filters for Roman. And you can, if you, if you observe Roman for an hour or maybe 55 seconds here, a minute or so, you can follow up these uh, at one gigaparsec up to a week or two. So this, I think that for 04, I'm not very uh, optimistic, but 05 should hopefully get better, uh, more multi-messenger events. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I, I just wanted, wanted to, to, to flag uh, another way of finding Kilonovi, which is not necessarily multi-messenger in, in a way that is not following up events from gravitational wave detec detections, but from gamma ray burst. And so, as you remember, this neutral star merger produce a jet, they power a gamma ray burst, a gamma ray burst afterglow. And this search for Kilonovi was done for many years before 2017. Uh, and there were some claims of Kilonovi in association with gamma ray burst. But in the past years, I, I think we have better instruments, better understanding, and uh, I wanted to, to, to flash flash two examples of uh, in the past couple of years where Kilonovi were detected in association with GRBs. And more surprisingly, actually, with long GRBs, so these other class that are typically connected to 
a massive uh, explosion of massive stars rather than interstellar merger. And so this, this is one example from uh, two years ago, roughly, um, of a long GRB. So this is the duration, typical duration uh, uh, for GRBs, and this is the value for this event, which was associated with the source galaxy. And what you see here, it's a bit busy plot, but what you see is that uh, here you have the prediction from the GRB afterglow, these dashed lines in different filters. And, and these 